Good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome to Stock Talk. My name is Sean Kaback with Manitoba Agriculture and Portage and I will be your host. We also have with us Pam Iwachesko in Dauphin and Aaron Dieterle in Dauphin looking after the technical side. Manitoba Agriculture is offering a series of livestock and forage webinars to help Manitoba producers. These webinars will run monthly starting in December until April. We're glad you can join us for today's presentations, which will be recorded so you can view them at a future date or if you can't make the one o'clock start. Mild weather this winter has made cattle feeding easier and will help with this year's feed supplies. However, colder weather as of late will require extra feed and especially energy. Grain is your best energy source with corn higher than barley, which is higher than oats. And right now, corn is the most economical energy source. The Resilient Ag Landscape Program is now open for applications with a January 22nd deadline. Producers can apply for grasslands and grazing management or agroforestry BMPs. Funding is available for rotational grazing, alternative water sources, or forage establishment. An environmental farm plan is required and EFPs can be completed online on Manitoba Agriculture's website and cost sharing up to 75% is available up to $15,000. The Sustainable Agriculture Manitoba program has three beneficial management practice categories under cropland management, manure and livestock management, and water management. Cost sharing for funding would cover improvements such as water supply development, forages on sensitive soils, enhanced feed efficiency, and more. And this application intake will be opening soon, so pay attention to, to Manitoba Agriculture's website and any advertising that will be carried out for this. There are a number of new 2024 cost production and calculators available on Matabag's website. And it's important to know your expenses and revenue so you can pencil out profitability. So to start off today's presentations, we have Dr. Susan Marcus of Lakeland College in Alberta, and she will be talking about smart beef cows on smart farms and new technology that they're utilizing and which will become available to producers. These recordings were made at the Mantua Beef and Forage Conference in December. So our presenters are not live, so we will take questions and we'll have to get back to you with the answers if we can't answer the questions today. So we'll just queue up our presentation. So this morning I was invited to talk about some of the work we're doing in Alberta and you know I, her with the introduction of me of all my background education I'm just a farm girl from the Paw Manitoba. So what I do now with um, Alberta at the college is a number of projects that are applied research. So <clears throat> just to orient you to what we're doing with applied research, it basically means that I need to work with industry ranchers and farmers on issues that they think are important and without their support the research that I do really wouldn't get done because it needs to be funded by these different commodity groups and the ranchers need to, you know, they want to have this particular solution looked at. So I do um, also work in the area of technology and new innovations, primarily because when I started with Lakeland College, they had just introduced a new Bachelor of Ag Technology degree program. And that degree program um, allows students that have had like a two-year diploma in ag move into a further two years of study and get this bachelor's degree. And it entails a one year of coursework but in their second year, they're put into a practicum or internship type situation. And so they work with different companies that are using different technologies. But I've also hired some of them to help me with my research. And they've been excellent students because they usually come from some kind of a farm background. And so I can incorporate them into my research and they can do the real hands-on, the cowboy stuff, all those things that I need them to do with the cattle. Um, it works out really well, plus they have that background in a lot of GIS, GPS, mapping. They get that good base from that degree program. So I strongly encourage you, if anyone's thinking of a degree, Lakeland College is an option for you. So what we need to do is, you know, get producers. We need to um, also get the students learning about some of my research. 
because I'm using technology that has promise. So it's something that in the future a rancher might want to adopt. Now a lot of the stuff I'll show you today is probably a little too pricey right now. But in time, those um, technologies will come down and there are some great applications for where they can be used. Um, and then of course I have to do extension and KTT work, so get the word out that these things either work or don't work or they work under certain situations and not others. So the first project I want to talk about is what we call our GPS bull project. And this project um, was brought to me by Highland Feeders, so that's a large cow-calf and feedlot operation up in northern Alberta. Um, they run about 2,500 cows, uh, a lot of them in Alberta, but they do pasture some in Saskatchewan. And so we were funded by um, the CAP program, Canadian Agriculture Partnership, and then RDAR, Results Driven Ag Research. University of Alberta was also um, a partner on this with me because they were also looking at the same GPS tags under different scenario in their pasture. So I think you can appreciate <clears throat> that the issue that this farmer had, and probably very much like we would find pastures in the Inner Lake area, a lot of bush, a lot of forest. Um, you don't just go to check your cows and see them all. You ha they're hiding, um, you know, a little bit of different topography. And so we wanted to see if we could track our bulls because his issue was when he sends his cattle up to those northern heavily forested pastures up in northern Alberta, he has a far higher open rate than on the pastures that are in the central and, and southern region. And so he thought the bulls get separated. He knows the bulls just get separated from the cows. If the bull isn't with the cow, he can't do his job. And we know from research that the number one sense that a bull uses to find a cow to breed is actually sight. Okay, the, the smell and the, and the sound and all those things come in later, but really sight. So if the bull can't see the cow, he doesn't know to hang out with her for the breeding season. So if we could keep the bulls from getting separated from these cow groups, then that was what this rancher wanted. So what we used was um, a commercially available tag. So we had to use what was out there. Now, now in the in the last couple of years, there's been a few more products come on the market. But at the time, we we're basically limited to uh, an Australian product called Series, and it's in the bottom, um, the very bottom of these pictures. So it has the one version has two pins. It's a GPS direct to satellite, so you don't need any infrastructure. You don't need a receiver or something else in your pasture. Um, it's solar uh, charge, so there's a battery in there. And the following year, so that was the first year, that was the only product they had. The following year, we did research after I met with the company and said, here's some of the issues we've had with this two-pin tag. It looks great because you think two pins, oh, that, that's sturdy. That's not falling out of there. But um, when they did their engineering um, pull tests, they pulled the back from the front and they said it's titanium pins. That's not going to come apart. I said, what you failed to do was the crush and the smash test that when you have bulls in a pasture fighting with each other, they basically fight and they smash those pins together and wiggle them around and get caught and then they would fall out or rip an ear. So then this past year, they introduced a new reusable product because again, that two pin one was not reusable. Once you put it in, it was to last the life of that animal. And, I mean, if it died before the, the animal, well, then you didn't get much life out of it. So they put a reusable one on the market, which is the green-backed one. And that one is just your, your standard all-flex, one-pin backing. And it worked actually really quite well. So our second year of ear retention is really good. We're quite happy with that one. Up on the top, I'll just show you... Um, other ones we considered. It was called a movement tag. It's the orange one. It wasn't quite commercially available. It doesn't look as nice as the other ones, a little more crude. Um, it had a receiver that you had to have. So, of course, that wasn't something we wanted to work with long term, but we did have a few on demo. And then the final one on top on the horses, because that was our practice. And again, like I said, my um, summer student doing the intern, the practicum, that was his dream job. I sent him out to check pastures on his horses and he used some of his young colts to get practice riding pastures. Um, he thought it was great. He got, he got to ride around, check the bulls, 
And then I could look at the data to see where the GPS tag, if it picked up accurately where he was, and I knew that he stopped at lunch at Subway and he had supper at Tim Hortons. So, so we tracked him just, you know, with the tag outside of the pasture. Um, and it, and it did work well, except there was an issue, and those are the Norwegian tags. We're waiting for them to actually show up to use them um, with Mary Jane at MBFI. Um, the tag, you know, robustness for the way it's built is fine. It just, there was issues with the data coming back to us. So we're still waiting on that Norwegian tag. So some of the things it can show you, and, and, and I put on here two screens from the actual platform that is giving us the data because the way that series tag works is you buy the tag but then you pay another company to get the data and a lot of these technology companies they work that way right it's subscription basis you think you've bought something and you own it well now you have to pay someone else to get the data for you um, every rancher hates that model but that's sort of so common with um, all this technology and so on the left upper one we can get the paths that an animal has moved and it's tracked. So each line, and I can color it differently, each line, each color is a different path. Oh. So that's the top one. On the bottom one, we can color code the animal. So we color coded cows are pink, the bulls are blue, just so I knew where they are. And so I want to show you this video and I don't, will the video play? Or do I have to press the button? Tap it. Okay. So this shows when we turn the bulls out at um, for the breeding season, and then as the cattle move through all the pastures, so I know where they've gone. I know, um, you know, if the bulls are not moving with the cows, how they've tracked through these pastures. You'll see that one black line moving around there. Okay. I'll explain that in a minute. Then you see a blue one taken off there. Okay. And then there's another couple of blue ones. Looks like he's not with the rest of the group in the middle there. Now the group is coming grazing. They found him again. Okay, so you, you can appreciate all these things that were happening with these GPS tags. So just to orient you what was happening, those pastures, that group of uh, 350 cows and 16 bulls had access to these um, seven quarters, and we rotated them through them from the bottom, number one, up to three. There's two quarters in that block of three. Then they moved to four, five, and six. What happened with that... Um, tracking that you see is we know bulls got left behind because even when the cowboys go to open the gates and do moves they can't see all the animals and in fact the first year when they were doing one of the moves um, the particular technology we were working with didn't have a smartphone app for it so the cowboys couldn't see where the animals were so then they phoned me they're like susan can you go on the computer we think we're missing about 30 cattle can you tell us where they are so we don't have to ride the whole pasture so I go on the computer, I'm like, oh, they're in the southwest corner, thanks. And then off he goes and, and can round them up and they didn't have to waste time looking around. But back to that tracking, that one animal that was in the black coloring, and maybe you can play it again, the, can you play the video again? If I go back, to, yeah. Okay. So the one black one is a cow tagged from the first year's trial. Okay, and so that's just another group. There's only one cow in there that's in a whole big group, but she's the only one that had the tag left because, again, I had those two pin GPS tags that fell out. So that group of cattle is close to my group of cattle, and, of course, when the bull got separated from the other cows, he ends up going into that group because that's the closest cows he could see, so why not? The other thing you might have noticed, there was one blue um, bull that kind of sped off a little quickly. Um, we noted that he got injured, and so when the cowboys went to pick him up, when they're driving out in a truck, he moves a lot faster than when he's just walking around the pasture. So you see that too. We, I saw, you know, when I look at the data daily, I can see, oh, somebody's either cattle rustled or the cowboys have taken care of him, take him home. So those types of things are very useful with this, with this technology. Um, what else was I going to say about the cows? Oh, and then, of course, injured. So you'll see a bull that just isn't moving as much. Of course, I've sped it up there, and that was the whole breeding season. So that was basically, you saw 60 days in, in you know, 10 seconds. When you slow it down, you see a lot more um, nuances of how they're behaving. The other thing you notice is where they have and haven't grazed. So that was quite obvious. Now, there was one patch up on the, would have been the north of the pasture six, 
Um, they didn't want to graze that, and I couldn't figure out why, because it looks fairly open. It's more of an open pasture in the number six. Um, but the water sources are all in the south, so they tend to stay in the south. So in that particular quarter, he wasn't getting as good utilization of the pasture because the cattle just stuck around the water more so. And the other one was, of course, in the pasture three, where it was so heavily forested, they hardly went in that, that bush area. So there's a big patch there. So once we look back at the data, or even from a week to a week, we can see where they are overgrazing, where they're not grazing. And now that he knows this about the, the cattle, you know, he can make some changes about maybe moving them in and holding them in an area or maybe a cross fence if that's something he wants to do. But the GPS was really handy for finding, you know, how many of these bulls that we, um, that were getting separated and not breeding. So the other thing, we had an, uh, the similar GPS technology going at the college with, with the cattle there. And they've got um, what they call the research herd that I'm allowed to work with. It's about 100 cows in this, in this herd. And we tagged, again, we never tag all the cows because it's too expensive. Probably you'll ask me at the end, how much did those tags cost? Well, they're about $150. Um, if you want the two-pinned tag that gives you data every hour, you can pay $400 for that. Now. What I found about some of these technology companies is overpromise, underdeliver. So they may say you get every hour um, data. Not totally their fault. You do need to know that if you're dealing with a company that's in Australia, that they're likely going to be dealing with satellites that are in the southern hemisphere. Those don't come over as often as the ones that are in the northern hemisphere. And so that's why issues with not consistent data, like they say on their website. Now, if I was an Australian rancher, I might be getting every hour, but not in Canada. So that's just one of the issues. And the other one was when you have the GPS technology on forested areas and there's solar, um, the battery is a solar battery, it can't get charged up when the cow is in the forest grazing for a day. And especially if you've got some rainy days or cloudy cover, it just doesn't get enough sun. So there might be a few days when you're losing data or you don't get everything that you think you should. But in the scheme of things, when I look from start to end on a breeding season, I have some pretty good information here for this, for this rancher. And so I've done other talks, and there was a lot of interest from some community pastures. They thought, you know, to tag the bulls that go in just to know that they're with the cows, that they're moving, because again, that series tag, and like a lot of these GPS tags, it has accelerometers in it. So you not only get the GPS fix or the location where the cattle are, you also get an activity level. So to know that it's you know extreme level, it means he might be running somewhere or getting chased by something, versus low or no level, meaning he's sick and laying down or dead, are all useful pieces of information in, in, you know, in, in with that GPS um, fix. Now, it's not foolproof. Like I said, some tags fall out. So you're, the tag is there. It's not the bull. He's not sick. You go there and you usually can find it. We've done some what we call recovery missions. We put in the last known GPS coordinates of those tags into our drone. We send the drone there. It hovers above and then we can walk in that area and we usually find the tags. The GPS fixes are accurate. Okay, so at the college, what happened was we tagged them. Um, you see a lot of activity up the side is just, that's their travel path. It was a narrow alley that they had to go for water to the north. And when we looked at this week one and then week two of just mapping where they were, what they were doing, Cal 31C ended up being on the wrong side of the pasture and no one figured that out in the first two weeks. Because part of my research was I just, you know, look at the data periodically. Um, I'm not always checking the cattle. The odd time I will go out and, and, and check the cattle. But I compile the data and then look at it when I have time. So obviously when I had time and I alerted them that 31C has been on the wrong side for all this time, she got missed and she ended up being open. So she missed her breeding window. So that explained her issue. Um, and then we get to see where the cattle are, obviously. So you wonder sometimes about your bulls. Like I said, they were injured, some were hurt in that of those 16 bulls, we, um, we had two, we had one that got injured with a, a leg issue and another one that broke his penis. And sometimes you wonder, geez, how does all this happen? They're spread out, they've, you know, sure when you turn them out initially, that first week or so, a lot of activity, the bulls are fighting, but after that, they really spread out and go with their cow groups. Well, this video will explain it, so can you play the video? 
So again, part of my students' work was to go out and validate some of this GPS activity with a drone. And so one day he went out and, and flew the drone and captured this incident. And it helped explain why that one bull was injured like he was. <clears throat> so we typically have, it, most times, yeah, right over on his back. So you typically have more than one bull find, you know, is with one cow. So they're always competing. And that's the end of that video. You can, we can advance it. So that's our GPS um, information. Of course, we're compiling some of what, what it means, return on investment of these tags. Uh, we know there were some bulls that weren't with the cow group for at least four or five days. You know, what does that mean to you in terms of how many bulls do you need to put in? How many potential, you know, pounds lost if you have later, um, the herd moving a little later into breeding? So all that data is coming um, yet. So the next one is this ranching, um, precision ranching, the heifer selection, and also the grazing efficiencies. And that's the project that I've partnered with Mary Jane and MBFI on, as well as a group um, with Thompson Rivers University, that's out of Kamloops, Alberta. We have a rancher from Buck Lake Ranch, and that's in the, um, if you've ever gone skiing in Big White, south of Kelowna, he's just south of that area. So we had a lot of um, funding, uh, good interest in this project. Again, Highland Feeders is my Alberta ranch that I was working with. Um, used a lot of different technologies, and I'm going to break it down, some of the things that we, we did with this. So it's two parts. Part of this was about mapping your, the ranch and your assets and what you can get from that land um, assessment. And the other part is about selecting replacement heifers and really selecting replacement heifers as early as possible in their life as you can, as opposed to our current standard, which is we select the heifers that we like the looks of, or we have pedigree, or we have date on them, and then we turn them out to be bred with a bull, and we limit it to 42 days or less, and whoever's open goes, and whoever's pregnant stays. Well, that's fine, but if my, you know, pasture resources that I need to turn all those animals out onto are limited, if I could know who was the better or the chance of, you know, one that's more reproductively mature, a better chance of being bred before I used up the pasture um, would be ideal. So that's the intent of this project. So let's start with the um, pasture mapping information. So the BC Ranch was my demo here where we did everything on. Again, we sent out a drone, it mapped, and again, we can program the drone and it just runs back and forth. It's just, it's like an autonomous drone. It just moves, once we put the coordinates in, it just maps everything. So now we can, we have this basically a digital twin or what we call a 3D picture of your ranch. We know where the, the barn is in the middle. We know or where the feedlot pens are, his roads, fence lines, all that stuff we can map. And I worked with this company called Lamazoo Interactive. They're out of Victoria, BC. And they've been in the space of mostly forestry and mining. And they map those particular, um, the assets of the forestry and mining, and then build them these same kind of digital maps so that, uh, for instance, in mining, they can track, and with GPS and trucks, they can track when the trucks come in, how long it takes them to come in, pick up a load, go out, you know, how fast people are in the, and improve the efficiencies on the trucks, and even um, how long it takes to fill up the piles of gravel. Like, all those things can be mapped once they put GPS on the, on the tractors and equipment, and they know where they're going and, and how, you know, fast they go. So the ranchers thought, can we do something similar? And so that's where this has come about. You get many layers of data. So I'm just quickly showing you without a whole lot of detail that, you know, they can put all the assets and, and, and layers of data to it in different ways. So this is one way, a true picture of that season. But the other way is you can do a heat map. And so when we say the heat map, we can see from the different crops you know, on the different pieces which have more exposed soil, so a thinner area of the crop compared to where it's more lush. And so your red shows up as maybe less vegetation compared to the, you know, darker green. And of course, the forest ones, you know, the trees show up blue, a little cooler. And so that's all important information for if you're planning for drought, where the areas that are drier are located compared to the ones that, that are not, that have more lushness, or even how heavily you graze it. 
The other thing we did was layer on those GPS tags. So now each one of those little teardrop orange points is an actual cow with a GPS tag in her ear. And in BC, um, they don't have perimeter fencing on all their grazing land. So they graze these forest reserves. And so when you send the cattle out from your yard and your land, they go up into the mountains as far as they want. And typically what brings them home is cold weather or they get hungry. Oh, I didn't. Oh, okay, well, look to this side. Okay, so on the other side, we can see that um, we've got all the points of the cattle, so I know where they are. Um, really interesting stuff here with how far they travel out because these ranchers never really knew how far the cattle would go. And, you know, we have some recorded over 18 kilometers away from the base ranch. And the other funny thing was um, at the end of the season when the cattle were coming in, um, this particular producer, he had um, three heifers that were missing, missing in his yard, but he knew exactly where they were because their GPS tag um, thankfully stayed in. They don't all stay in, like I said. And they were at his neighbor's farm. And so he phoned to the neighbor and he said, when am I getting back my, my three heifers? And the guy said, what do you mean? What heifers? And he said, well, those three heifers of mine, I know they're over there. Oh, I don't, what do you mean? Like he, he was denying that he had his heifers. He, and so my rancher said, they have GPS tags in them. I'm coming over to get them. Just let me know when you're home. And that was the end of that story. He said, now his neighbor respects him a little more than he used to. <laughs> so when we dial into that pinpoint, that, you know, teardrop, I can get down now with this particular twinning of the ranch to this cow avatar, I'll call, call her. And so if I need to know what cow is out there back in that bush, because we've put all these layers of data in, I know, you know what her tag number is, I know some information about her, what age she is. Whatever I've put in in the background on these cows when we entered this data is now accompanying her wherever she moves along. So I, I know exactly which cow is where with this layer of data. Um, and again, because, I mean, this might not be in every um, province, but in BC, because the forestry mapping is so good, they have a lot of elevation and, and different um, aspects to it, and so we can get that part as well. So in here, I'm just showing you that we have, you know, elevation change, uh, the distances, and so if you were trying to find where these cows were, you know, you could look at what is the elevation there, is there a path that I can go to travel and get her? All those aspects are now part of your map, and you can look at, you know, deeper into the layers if, if need be. Now, right now, this is not something that any rancher is going to jump out and, and purchase. Uh, far too expensive. I almost hate to say what the subscription is, but I'll tell you. <laughs> I just think it's so outrageous. So for one year subscription, you can have this on your ranch for $20,000. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so now you know about the expensive stuff that's sort of way out in the future, but there's a lot of promise, and I mean, there's bits and pieces of it that certainly do work. And like I said, the GPS tags, they've, they've come a long way. There's another one um, that I think has maybe more promise than what we're waiting on with our Nor Norwegian tag that's yet to show up. Um, 701X, I think it's out of North Dakota or South Dakota, so it's an American product, which means North American satellites, which means that's good because they come over a lot, a lot more often. Um, so maybe if you're thinking of GPS tags, and especially, like I said, um, community pastures or just for a few bulls to know where they are works quite well. So 701X is maybe something to look into. All right, the next part of this project was the actual heifer development. So I really focused here on commercial heifers. So I just want to know who's got commercial cattle as opposed to being purebred. Okay, so a good variety. All right, so we know it's not as easy getting commercial um, heifer sort of EPDs and information genetically because you know, the breeds have those, and when you cross them, you don't know what you're getting. So we have a number of um, genomic tools that I'll talk to later. But first, the two research questions. So like I said, is there some indicator, some trait, is there anything that we can know sooner in that heifer's life that would help us select her as being a promising breeding female as opposed to waiting until she, you know, she doesn't catch and then I have to color or sell her? And then, of course, what tools are out there? Because I, I don't want to allocate any of my expensive resources, and it's probably no different here than it is in Alberta, where it's hard to get labor, 
we don't have a whole lot of extra people around and so any job that we can you know get done by just ourselves or you know without having to hire someone um, is ideal so Again, so the focus for a cow-calf producer, you know, your number one um, economic trait is going to be fertility. Without fertility, you don't have, you know, the economics in that herd. And then your growth traits are next, and then your carcass would be number three. So we really are focusing here on fertility, but not giving up, you know, any growth and, and carcass traits. So we want to keep track of them, but the focus is really fertility. So in the center, you'll see I have a, um, it's a bolus. It's, it's about... Um, 10 centimeters in, in length. We put one of those boluses in every one of these research heifers. And so that bolus has in it a thermometer, so it tracks her temperature on an hourly basis, and it also tracks her um, activity. There's an accelerometer in there. Now, that bolus does need a receiver, so those heifers need to be passing by the receiver every now and again so that it can download her data. Works decently well, right, Mary Jane? It's Okay, yeah. <laughs> and so the intent of it was, it was for the dairy industry initially, that's what it's been developed for. We wondered if it had applications with beef cattle to let us know when the heifer's in heat. Because what we know about heifers in heat is if heifers have had at least two heats, or if they've hit puberty and had two cycles, and then they get exposed to a bull, their chances of being bred or their likelihood to conceive is about 20 to 30% higher than if they're immature and they've only had one cycle or no cycles. Okay, so we wanted heifers that were mature enough for our program. So whether you're, you're breeding them to calve in February or May or whatever, doesn't matter. It's just you want them to be mature enough for your program. So in this case, this herd uh, at the college was um, May calving. So they're a later calving herd. And so we had those in there. We also did feed efficiency testing. So are you familiar with um, grow safe bunks where you can do individual feed testing? So we did that on the Alberta group. We didn't have access to that equipment at Manitoba nor in BC, but I do have it for Alberta. And so most of my results here are about the Alberta group. And then we had a one cup AI camera that's up on the top. And that was basically to validate what we saw in the pens, mostly for looking if the heifers are in heat, jumping each other. But the other thing was it, um, it was there to, like our project was there to help this one cup AI company develop the algorithm for heat because we need to tell the camera that when you see two heifers jumping or chin resting or whatever the behavior is, that means they're coming into heat. So please alert us to that. So that camera had to get trained with noticing when that happened in the pen. Um, we, yeah, we did some DNA, and of course, we did some uh, carcass ultrasound as well. So I'm just going to show um, what happens here in this particular video. We, we have the night cameras on, and you know, you think when it's nighttime, everyone should be resting. But what happens is, if someone's in heat, they're going to let everybody else know about it in the group. So it disturbs everybody. And so, you know, she's having her nighttime snack. Everyone else is bedded down, but you know what? Just so everyone knows. Yeah. <laughs> so that way we could validate. And so again, the camera allowed us to go back and I had a summer student look through the video and just validate, you know, who was in heat and when. Oh, advancing, okay. So with that bolus, what it does is about three or four hours after a heat event like that, and the heat event is triggered because she has increased activity and increased temperature, and then um, that activity and temperature goes down after about three hours or so, you get this peak that it shows here, temperature and activity increased, and then a f three to five hours later, that bolus will alert you on your smartphone to your app that she's probably in heat. Now, what we know about the bolus, like I said, it's for the dairy industry, so they're confined, they have a little less activity normally than what a beef animal would, um, so a lot of false positives. We've sent our data back to this company. They can, they're rerunning the algorithm. So hopefully that'll improve what a uh, heat alert would be for a beef animal. Um, let's see, the other thing about that. Yeah, the false positives. Oh, and then with the beef heifers. Okay, so they're more active. Um, and also young heifers. If a yearling heifer has this bolus, you get way more false positives than when she's a two-year-old or three-year-old. So just general activity level settles down and really no different than uh, 
kids, right? I mean, they're, when they're young, they're all energy and rambunctious, and as you get older, you don't have as much energy, so it, it does change there. So it was um, somewhat useful when we sent the ones that we actually, uh, like I had observations on them from my staff, to say, okay, here, we know she's in heat, let's check the bolus, and fairly good, but it's not perfect. So we're still waiting again for that company to, and it's out of, um, it was a Hungarian and a Irish uh, company together that were doing this data. So this morning I was invited to talk about some of the work we're doing in Alberta. So we're going to end Susan's presentation there. There is a little bit more that you can go into Stock Talk later and watch the full presentation of Susan's as well as John's. We had to ed edit them for Stock Talk today, so they're not the full length. But uh, Susan does go into a little bit more on the importance of fertility and heifer selection. And one of the tools was uh, reprodu reproductive tract scoring that she, she goes into and but she did mention that selecting those earlier cycling heifers, you are they are going to be 20 to 30 percent more likely to be bred when they are exposed to a bull. So I'm just going to queue up the next presentation. And this is Dr. John Campbell of the Western College of Veterinary Medicine. And he is going to go through some of the findings from the Canadian Cow Calf Surveillance Network. years, which was called the Canadian Cow-Calf Surveillance Network. Um, I am not the only person involved in this. It's a huge team of people. So we had uh, Dr. Waldner, my colleague at the U of S, who did uh, an awful lot of work and is, is carrying on the project for another five years. Um, colleagues from Calgary, Guelph, Montreal, uh, other colleagues from the U of S, and then People that do the real work, Charlene was was kind of the research tech that uh, helped keep everything going, and then tons of graduate students and uh, um, who some are still working on their theses out of data out of this uh, out of this project. So thanks to all of them, I sort of was just the person uh, trying to coordinate all the herd all the cats, I guess. Why did we get funded by the BCRC for this? I guess I think there's a few reasons. One is that we're just trying to benchmark what's going on in the industry. We're trying to figure out what's normal, what's abnormal, you know, what what should we expect in terms of productivity, things like that. It also helps us identify where we need more research and what we're doing well as an industry if we have some good news stories to tell to the public. And, and sometimes we figure out what we could be doing better too. So. I, it, that's really the purpose of, of sort of animal health surveillance is to, is to look at those sort of topics. At the end of the day, we're probably not going to identify new diseases or things like that. It's the producers and the veterinarians out there on the front lines. They're the ones that are going to find the, find, the, find the new things and, and identify the real issues. Uh, but we're just trying to put some numbers to some of those things as we go along. And... You folks do it all the time, right? If you're keeping records, whether it's on paper or on the barn door or uh, on a fancy uh, computer program or a sp Excel spreadsheet, you're benchmarking, you're taking, you're sort of tracking that stuff. And we were just trying to collect some of that data. So it actually started five years before this in 2012. Uh, our first project uh, with BCRC. Uh, we did it just in Western Canada, so the three prairie provinces, uh, about 130 odd herds, 125 herds uh, across Western Canada. That's where they all were. I know that there's some of the people in this room that were uh, pr producers that participated in it from Manitoba, uh, and we really appreciate those folks that did that. Many of those people stayed on for another five years, so they've been uh, they've been warriors with uh, with us doing this. As it went on so it went so well bcrc came back to us and said hey we want you to do it another five years but we want all of canada so this is the herds across canada we did we overrepresented eastern canada a little bit just because they wanted some data from there and and you know if we picked sort of representative numbers of what eastern canada we'd only have 10 herds in ontario and 
five herds in Quebec or something like that. So they're a little overrepresented compared to the Western herds to some extent, but we sort of mimic uh, the beef industry pretty well when you start looking at the numbers across the Western provinces and uh, then in the East as well. Well, we collected a lot of stuff from these herds. So we collected their production data every year. So we got some data from their calving records and how many calves died before 30 days of age and abortions and stillbirths and things like that. And then we got weaning and pregnancy data. So how many cows tested pregnant? How many calves did you wean? Just really basic stuff. It really isn't that complicated. It's always more complicated than you think it is, though. When you start asking people these questions, they say, well, I got this group of cows and they calve in the fall. And this group of cows, that I breed them different because they're the purebreds. And it always is uglier than you think it is. Uh, and then every year we asked, a, asked them to fill out a survey on a particular topic, on, on some sort of animal management issue. Uh, so it was animal welfare practices, antimicrobial use, uh, vaccine use and technology adoption. And, and the last survey was on sort of biosecurity and pre-weaning calf mortality. So we got some really good information. I, I, uh, we also collected some biological samples. So uh, several times through the study in 2019, uh, we got local veterinarians to collect blood and fecal samples from cows at pregnancy checking time. And we tested them for some various diseases. We looked at trace mineral levels and we'll talk about some of those results in a minute. In 2020, we got some fecal samples from young calves uh, to look at antimicrobial resistance. Uh, and then we got some samples in 2021 from weaned calves uh, as, as at weaning time, again, some blood samples where we again looked at trace mineral levels and a couple other diseases. Just the logistics of doing that across all of Canada, you got to send sampling kits to veterinarians all across the country and they got to collect them the way you want them collected and they got to label them the way you want them labeled and then they got to send them all back to Saskatoon and get them mailed back here and it's January and it's cold and ugly and you got to have coolers, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, the logistics are are sometimes daunting when we when we start the biological stuff, but we managed to do pretty well and we had a lot of cooperation from the producers. So I can't talk about everything we learned in this study. There's too much and I'd be here all day, um, but I want to talk about a few of the highlights. I'm going to focus mostly on this on the first one or two, uh, and then we'll briefly touch on some of the, some of the other issues. But I want to start with. Uh, what we found out about trace minerals and uh, copper, selenium, molybdenum too, maybe a little bit, uh, just because I think it's such an important issue for, for us here in uh, Western Canada. So I want to talk about copper first. It's a pretty important trace mineral. Uh, we see copper deficiency in cows quite regularly when I deal with uh, herds with our disease investigation unit. There's two kinds of copper deficiency. So the first one is just, we call it primary. It's just there's not enough copper, right? They're not getting enough copper, either in their supplement or in the forages that they're eating, etc. There's not enough copper there, so they have copper deficiency. So we see that. We have lots of areas in Western Canada that have low copper in our soils and in our forages, and so we need to supplement our cows appropriately. We also see secondary copper deficiency where some other mineral binds up the copper in the rumen. So that can be iron, that can be molybdenum, that can be sulfates in the feed or in the water. And we have lots of places in Western Canada that have high molybdenum in the soil, high sulfates in the water. We feed high sulfate feeds from time to time like kochia, canola forages, especially in, in drought years where we might be going to those feeds. And uh, some of the polycrops, newer polycrops, have pretty high sulfate levels as well. So, so all those things happen in Western Canada. It's maybe not surprising that we see a fair bit of copper deficiency. So this is a summary of kind of all the cow results we did over four different, sam well, three different sampling periods. I uh, got east and west uh, broken out in 2019. And you can see that this is blood samples. So we just asked them to collect blood because it's hard enough getting vets to collect samples for us when they're preg checking to start with. So they just collected blood, which is not, we'll talk about whether blood or uh, liver biopsy is best. But if they're deficient on blood, they're really deficient. Okay, if they're deficient on their blood, that means they've used up most of the copper in their liver and now their blood's dropping. 
Okay, so if they're deficient, I know they're deficient. So this is probably an underestimate of how many deficient cows there are. And you can see the first year in uh, 2014 when we were just looking at the Western herds, 42% uh, of the cows were deficient in copper. These are herds that agree to participate in a research project. They're probably better than average. They work with their vet. They probably go to meetings like you guys do, right? They're the better herds. And 42% of the cows in Western Canada, we took 20 cows per herd. So there is no, just over 2,000 cows in that population. 42% of them were deficient wasn't quite as bad in 2016. Those were younger cows, and that's maybe partly why we, we, we looked at uh, uh, first and second calvers that year. Uh, 2019, again, not quite as bad as that first year, but still, almost a third of the cows that we sample are deficient in copper. These are herds that probably aren't having major problems necessarily. It's everywhere in our industry. Eastern province maybe provinces a little bit less so. So that's Ontario, Quebec, and the Atlantic provinces. If you go, so that's at 0.5 parts per million in the blood. That's what the lab calls deficient. And they use some, some references from back in the dark ages before I even graduated to sort of come up with those references. But if you go to the next level, they also have deficient and then they say less than adequate. So if you just go up one 0.1 part per million to 0.6 part per million, it's almost two-thirds of the cows in 2019 were less than adequate. That probably means they've used up a lot of liver because their blood's starting to drop, and they're, and they're probably, if we had biopsied those cows, we probably would have found even more deficient. So it's huge. Copper deficiency is a huge issue. I think it's unseen in our herds. I don't think we know what's going on. It affects performance. Uh, there's no doubt about it. So if you like pictures, this kind of shows you the darker areas are where there's more cows deficient in copper. This is not soil. This is not forages. This is cows, right? This is cows. So the cows are eating the stuff, and all those interactions are happening in the rumen, and this is what's showing up. And, and of course, we're interfering. We're using mineral tubs and mineral supplements and free choice minerals and all sorts of different ways too. So that's affecting the pattern too. But this is the cows. And you can see there's some pretty dark areas there in parts of Manitoba, uh, not very far from where we are now, uh, southern Saskatchewan, up around Saskatoon. There's lots of herds there too that are copper deficient too. Uh, and up as you go north and get into the bush country, it seems to be a little more common there too. Here's the 2014 data, just the Western Canada. It's a little easier graph to see, but it's almost exactly the same. It didn't really change a lot between those two years. Again, the darker areas, uh, those, uh, whoops, those really dark areas uh, are like 60 to 70% of the cows were deficient in those dark areas. Right, so that's deficient. That's like truly deficient. So it looks like it's not as big a problem uh, down in you know southern Alberta, uh, but um, there's a lot of it in sort of this neck of the woods and in my neck of the woods in around Saskatoon. We looked at molybdenum because it's one of the important trace minerals that ties up copper. So we measured molybdenum in the cows, and what was interesting is it didn't really explain the copper deficiencies. And I thought, and it also surprised me, I thought, oh, I'm going to see high molybdenum in Manitoba. You guys have high molybdenum in your soils, right? That's going to be where the problem is. It actually wasn't as big a problem in Manitoba as I thought it was, and I'll show you the graph there. There was, you know, 14% of cows were higher than recommended, so it's an issue in places, but it didn't correlate really well with the copper deficiency in this, in this case. Uh, not sure how you explain that. About a third of the herds had at least one cow uh, above the threshold. And again, if you look at the map, I know it's a little hard to see when I've got all of Canada there, uh, but Man Manitoba, uh, you know, there's a little pocket up here what's that around Swan River maybe in that sort of area uh, there's a little pocket up there but but uh, for the most part the dark areas are more southern uh, southern Alberta where we didn't have copper deficiency right so maybe up here in the north there's some linkage between
copper and molybdenum, but who knows. We also collected some samples in 2021 on calves at weaning. A little tougher to do in cow calf herds because not everybody handles their calves at weaning time and some of them just put them on the truck. So we didn't get quite as big a sample size, but it still shows up there. Almost, you know, almost a fifth of the calves we sampled were deficient in, uh, in copper. About 73% of the herds had at least one deficient calf. Uh, molybdenum, it wasn't, wasn't quite, as, quite as bad. Again, it didn't really uh, relate to the copper levels. Selenium, which we always think is a big issue, is not probably as big in Western Canada as, as we thought it was. Uh, only about, you know, less than 1% of the cows were deficient. Uh, there was 34% of the cows less than adequate, so it's still something to keep an eye on. Uh, but again, the geography of that, mostly around the foothills, uh, and then way worse in Eastern Canada. Again, we're not measuring forages. We're not measuring... Hey, we're not measuring soil, we're measuring cows, right? It's very different. Most of the graphs you see are soil maps and things like that. This is like what's going on in the cows, which is impacted by management, obviously. Uh, we did it in the calves. They're a little bit higher uh, issue in the calves when you look at them in weaning. And obviously, you know, making sure those young calves get adequate selenium at birth is probably an issue, especially if you're in a selenium deficient area. Well, let's go back to copper because I think it's the biggest problem. We looked at a bunch of these other trace minerals and, and well, they're kind of at levels I'd expect, but the copper one was, was much worse than I thought. The big issue probably with copper is impaired reproductive performance. And as part of my job at the Disease Investigation Unit, I get to go to lots of herds that are experiencing big infertility problems. And I would say that low copper is one of the most common diagnoses that we make. And when I mean low, like they are super low, super, super low. Uh, and it's impairing reproductive performance. Now, what happens at kind of those, you know, just less than adequate levels? Maybe they can do okay, but uh, I'll show you some work that we did in another study that sort of looks at some of that. You might see loss of color, bleaching of the hair coat. These black cows kind of look a little reddish sometimes. Um, you probably affects weaning weights in calves and, and milk production of cows. The other thing, though, it does is it affects the immune system. It impairs their immune system. It's necessary for immunity to work. They probably don't respond to vaccines as well. And the one thing that I see very commonly is that all of a sudden you see a parasite problem like coccidiosis in a group of calves or a cows that you don't expect. You know, they're spread out. They're not crowded together or things like that. And if you go in and look at them, often they're copper deficient. A vet texted me the other day. She had this yearling heifer that was, um, uh, she's just over the border and so, in Saskatchewan, she had this yearling heifer that was showing nervous signs. It just kind of had this tremor and, and wasn't doing much else, wasn't eating, had some bloody diarrhea, which is probably nervous coccidiosis, right? We see that sometimes in, in herds where, where an animal gets this nervous form of coccidiosis, which we don't really understand very well. Seen outbreaks of it in some, in some places as well. It's hard to treat, they often die. So she phones me up and said, oh, I'm seeing this. What do you think it is? And I said, well, it could be nervous coccidiosis. We talked about some other things and things like that. And I said, but why, why this one cow, right? Why, why a yearling cow getting, a yearling heifer getting coccidiosis? And I said, you know, if she dies, you should, you should send some liver in and see what happens. So she, di she did go on to die. She went down the next day and they euthanized her. They sent the liver in. She had 2.5 parts per million in her liver, Normal liver is 25 copper. She had 2.5. And I've seen that routinely in a bunch of other investigations where their liver copper is basically gone. Normal is 25 parts per million, and she was like a tenth of that. This is an old study that my colleague, Dr. Waldner, did in 2008. She looked at a community pasture, and she actually sampled these cows when they were going on to pasture pre-breeding, which is probably a better time to assess their copper status. It's actually... It's actually better correlated with the reproduction. The y-axis, so this axis on the left here, is the open rate. So this means these cows were really 
there was a lot of them open. I can't read the numbers, but it's like almost 90% of them were open. Okay, this is the copper value in their blood. Again, we just measured blood in this one because uh, we're bleeding cows as they're going on a community pasture coming off the trucks. It's, it's challenging to even do that. And then these are different age groups. So these are the young cows. And you can see once their blood copper starts dropping below 0.4 parts per million, the open rate just starts to skyrocket. It goes way, way up. The slightly older cows, kind of the middle-aged girls, the four to nine-year-olds, same thing, not quite as bad, right? And for some reason, the old girls, the 10 to 14-year-olds, I, I don't know whether we've selected them to deal with copper deficiency or what's happened, but they seem to, the, they've seemed to survive in the herd and they seem to not be affected as much down there. Now, there weren't as many of them as low in the really low values here, but you can see anywhere they get below, below 0 0.4, 0 0.5, somewhere in that bar, ballpark. So maybe that cutoff for 0 0.5 in the blood is pretty reasonable, right? That that is actually showing up in reproductive performance. It's, it's hugely obvious. I think... We're seeing huge open rates this year in herds all across Western Canada. It's a common theme. Some of it's drought and not enough feed and things like that. Some of it's probably copper. Some of it's a combination of things. So let's talk about dealing with it because that's the next question. So feed test rules, feed testing rules. I love feed testing. Do it. You know, Manitoba agriculture is probably telling you to feed test, use cow bites, but you cannot sort out trace minerals on cow bites completely. You can get a vague idea, but you can't sort out all the interactions between sulfate and iron and molybdenum and all that sort of stuff. You, it's impossible. If I ask a nutritionist, oh, I got this much sulfate, uh, you, you know, in my feed, how much copper should I feed? And they go, well, I don't know, right? Probably more than you know, normal, but they don't really know. So the only way... The only way I think you can assess your trace mineral status is by testing cows. And so that's my big mission before I retire, is to push more veterinarians into testing cows, you know, to assess trace mineral status, to get an idea where you are. You might be great. I go into herds and I test trace mineral status and they're fantastic. They're doing everything right. I don't need to tweak anything. It's good. Stop, right? I go into other herds where they think they're doing a good job and it's terrible, right? And it might be because they have sulfates. It might be because some, something else. Well, we've got to tweak it. But the only way I know if it's fixed is if I go back and test cows again, right? You've got to test cows. So you can do that with blood samples. That's better than nothing, right? If they're deficient on blood, they're really deficient, okay? Liver biopsies are probably the best. Talk about that in a second. How many cows? So we know free choice feeding or force feeding mineral is far, far better than free choice. Not every cow eats free choice mineral. And we, from this study, we did this at our Goodale farm at, at the vet college. We force fed half the cows mineral for three months, and they were six times more likely to have adequate copper when we sampled them in their blood at the end of that. If they, for, if they got the force-fed mineral, they came into heat twice as fast, and they got pregnant five days earlier. Now, five days earlier doesn't sound like much, but over a big group of cows, that's significant. That's the difference between 65% of your cows calving in the first 21 days versus 40%, right, or 30%. That's huge, and that's like, that's another 40 pounds of calf, right, when you, when you start thinking about that for that 20% of cows that calve later. Uh, and we know that pre-calving is a little more effective than post-calving. Like all things, it's tougher to catch cows up post-calving when they got those high lactation demands. So one of the things I think that has changed in the industry, when I first came to Saskatchewan in the 90s, everybody was bringing their cows into corrals and feeding them and vast majority, right? And we could force feed mineral or we could maybe monitor mineral a bit better. Now, so many of us are extended grazing, corn grazing, swath grazing, bale grazing, et cetera, et cetera. And we're relying on free choice mineral for a bigger and bigger portion of the year, not just the summer grazing season, but now we're doing it till, till January sometimes, right? And I think it's an issue. We got to figure out a way to drive mineral intake in those cows and worry about that, you know, throughout the year, not just, not just, uh, just before they calve. 
We do have some new options now. So Multimin is a trace mineral injectable product that just got licensed in Canada. It's been in the States for a while. We've had vets bringing it in on emergency drug release for a while. It might be an option in some cases. So it's about uh, three to 1400 pound cow. It's somewhere in the neighborhood about four bucks. Gives about 90 days. It's got copper, manganese, selenium, and zinc in it. Those are the four trace minerals it has. It probably gets, you know, it avoids, because you're injecting it, it avoids all the interactions in the rumen. It's probably a little slightly faster increase in liver copper than, than feeding it. But like all mineral supplementation, too much of a good thing can lead to toxicity, right? You can kill cows with copper. And I've seen groups of purebred bulls being fed too much supplement and dying of copper toxicity. You can kill cows with copper. You can kill cows with too much selenium, right? I had a vet phone me the other day. They had a group of cows that were severely copper deficient. She was thinking about multi, using Multimin. She tested cows, though, and this was down sort of Maple Creek area. They were all really high in selenium. They were high normal selenium. And I'd be worried if she gave the Multimin, she'd push the selenium up too high that she might cause toxicity, right? So it had to come up with another option. So I would say... You know, before you do anything, test some cows, get an idea where you're at before you start. Don't just start injecting cows six times a year with Multimin or something like that. Uh, you could create issues, right? Too much is, can, can cause problems. Okay, I'm going to move on to some of the other ones uh, uh, and talk a little uh, less time about them. I wanted to spend the most time on that one because I think it's such an important issue. So I want to talk about Yoni's disease because this was what probably the other uh, big accomplishment we made out of this project. Yoni's disease is, uh, many of you have probably heard about it, it's sometimes called paratuberculosis. It's this bacterial infection of the intestinal tract in cows. The bug has got this big long name, Mycobacterium avium paratuberculosis, and we just call it MAP, okay? So when I say MAP, I'm talking about the bug that causes this disease. It's a bacteria. It's got a waxy cell wall, so it survives in the environment for a long time. It can, it's, it's a terrible disease to try to get rid of in your herd. You want to keep it out if you don't have it. Animals usually become infected as a young calf. So an older animal can become infected, but most of them get infected as, as young calves. Their immunity is not as good. They're more likely to get it. So often they get it if their mother's infected. They'll very likely get it, right? But they could get it from another cow in the herd. Uh, and uh, the other thing that makes it tough to control is that it's kind of this silent infection for the first three or four years of life. They get infected as a calf, but they don't show any signs until they're four or five years of age. Okay, often. Sometimes it can happen earlier, but, but often it's three, four-year-old cows before they start showing clinical signs. So there's this very slow-growing bug. It's got a long incubation period. It takes a long time to show clinical signs. It's easy to diagnose, okay? It's two things. She's got the skinny cow losing weight, and she's got diarrhea that could thread a needle at 10 yards, okay? So don't stand behind her if she coughs. Um... <laughs> And, and so it, it is fairly easy to diagnose, right? And, and on pathology, we see these thickened intestines. It's, it's not a difficult diagnosis to figure out if you have it. Now, there's other things that can cause thin cows, right? So, you know, just because you have a cow losing weight doesn't mean you have yonis. But that combination is pretty characteristic. So they have weight loss. They keep eating. They look happy or reasonably happy until they get too thin. There's chronic diarrhea that doesn't go away. Often doesn't happen until they're a bit older. Eventually, they become emaciated and waste away, and we have to usually put them down uh, if, uh, if they're not shipped or something before that. They get this thickened intestine. They just can't absorb nutrients, and there's no treatment. We have nothing to treat these cows with. They're going to die, right, eventually. So we looked at it in 2019. We looked at it before this as well. We sampled as part of this thing. We were bleeding cows. We can look at antibody levels in their blood to see if they've been infected with yonis. So we got just over 3,000 cows uh, from about 160-odd cow-calf herds across Canada. And only 3% of cows were positive, which seems like, oh, that's okay. That's, not, that's pretty low. Uh, and it's lower than the dairy industry. The dairy, this is a bigger issue in the dairy industry, and that's where most of the research happens. Uh, 
and sorry about that. I'm having trouble here. Uh, this is just sort of saying, oh, we think the real level is somewhere between one and seven percent. Um, and and what that that was Eastern Canada. Western Canada was only one percent of cows, and that was similar to the data we got uh, in the previous round that we had done before. So one percent of cows, that's nothing, right? The trouble is, um, it you know somewhere between 15% of eastern herds and 10% of western herds had at least one animal positive. And remember, we only sampled 20 cows per herd. We didn't sample their whole herd. So that's probably an underestimate. There's probably some of the herds that came back, 10 cows all negative, that probably still had yonis in there. right? So one out of 10 herds in western Canada have yonis disease in them. And that seems to be growing, I think, compared to our previous data. Uh, and it's probably an underestimate. It's a t challenging disease to get rid of because the tests don't work very well. So we have two tests basically that we can use. We have a blood test that we used in our study. To, to, we use both of them actually. There's a blood test where we can look for the antibodies and there's a fecal test where we actually look for the blood, look for the bug itself with a PCR test. Okay, so we have a blood test and a fecal test. There's also a culture test where they try to grow the one. Takes forever, costs a fortune, almost no labs do it anymore. Okay, so, so we'll ignore that. It's because basically you can't get it done, costs too much uh, to culture it. So we use either this PCR on the feces or we use a blood test. We have two options, okay? So the individual, what we found out when this study, because we did both on a whole bunch of these cows, which had never been done in beef cows before. We had almost 3,000 cows, right? And we did both the blood test and the fecal test. And because we did both, we can figure out which test works the best. And there's complicated math behind it, which I don't want to go into. Bottom line is the fecal test was far better at finding positive animals. The fecal test is far better at finding positive animals. It's a way better test. And before this study, I sort of said, oh, they're about the same. Maybe the fecal test is a bit better. It's actually incredibly better. The nice thing about the, fe the fecal test is we can pool samples. So you take individual samples from the cows, right? Submit them to the lab, and the lab will pool them in groups of five, usually. And they'll test that pool of five cows and if it's negative they're done right they don't have to test them again if it's positive then they take the individual samples and test them again to figure out which cows were positive in that pool so it saves some money because i think this costs 40 to 50 bucks a test right in that ballpark so so if you can save some money on it it's quite a bit more expensive than the blood test which is more in the 14 15 bucks a test okay the blood tests are great still they're, they're useful they can give you an idea if you have yonis in your herd or not but they're not good, as good at finding the in infected animals to try to eliminate them from your herd, okay? The pool test, uh, actually, when you go from the individual test to the pooling, that actually gets a little less better at finding the positives, but it's probably worth it still to... to so this morning, I was invited to talk about some of the work we're... So Dr. Campbell really stressed the importance of getting a handle on your copper levels in the cattle herd and how through their survey, they found 24 to 43% of cows were deficient in, in copper. So to alleviate copper shortages, ensure adequate mineral is being supplemented in the cattle rations. Force feeding mineral for three months previous to calving resulted in six times more cows likely to have adequate copper compared to free choice. And cows force-fed mineral cycled two times faster and became pregnant five days later. And that uh, one picture of the black-hided cow that he had in his presentation, that's often an indication or can be an indication of a, a copper deficiency. So if you're seeing that in, in your herd, especially on the black-hided animals, uh, you should ensure that your, your copper levels are adequate in your feeding program. So the full presentations are available on Stock Talk. Uh, Dr. Campbell was going to talk a little bit more on antimicrobial resistance, as well as technology and biosecurity practices and animal welfare. So thank you to our presenters. Some really good presentations there, lots of information. Um, if you want, you can go back and watch the recordings. You might even want to watch it a few times just to be able to take in all that information.
So there is another Canadian cow calf survey being conducted. BCRC is looking for producers to, to participate. It's available online. Information is being collected to understand long-term trends in production method efficiencies and results will be shared later this year. And you can go to the beefresearch.ca backslash survey for the BCRC on the BCRC's website. So our next stock talk is February the 15th. We will have an MASC forage insurance update, talk about livestock predation and a cattle market update from Canfax. March 14th is Ask the Vet. April 11th is on forage and pasture management, poisonous plants and replacement heifer management. I'd like to thank you for joining us today and hope to see you next time on February the 15th. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day.